Now to a case that we covered uh, last night on Making the Case. The verdict uh, is in for a former political donor named Ed Buck, who faced charges in connection with the death of two men. The case sounds like a movie involving drugs, sex, money, and race. BNC's Anita Bennett reports from Los Angeles. The jury deliberated four and a half hours before they reached a guilty verdict. It's a moment the victim's family and friends say they waited years to see. It's been a long four years to the day. A mother speaks out on the four year anniversary of her son Jamel Moore's death. On Tuesday, a federal jury in Los Angeles found Democratic donor Ed Buck guilty of killing and drugging Moore and Timothy Dean in his West Hollywood apartment. The prosecutors were awesome. They were awesome. They fought for Jamel and Tim and all the victims like they were their own family members. They made me proud. Moore died in 2017. Dean's death followed two years later. Prosecutors said Buck lured poor black men to his home for sex, then injected them with methamphetamine and sedatives. It's sad and it's sobering and it's scary and it's, it's messed up. Moore's roommate pointed out local law enforcement initially refused to investigate the 66-year-old white businessman. First off, they ruled Jamel's murder a, a an overdose and closed the books and everything. I mean, that same night. The feds stepped in after another man escaped Buck's apartment and paramedics saved his life. What we saw today was that uh, the survivors who came forward, who stood strong in their truth, were believed, were heard, and that's what delivered justice today. And it was obvious to a jury of the defendant's peers. Buck's lawyers argued the victims went willingly to his client's home to party and play. What would you want us to know about Jamel? That Jamel was a person that despite whatever the defense said about Jamel, that Jamel was a person, he was a good person. Now, a sentencing date has not yet been set, but prosecutors say Ed Buck could spend the rest of his life in prison. Reporting from downtown Los Angeles, I'm Anita Bennett for BNC. Prosecutors said Buck liked to meet younger men on gay meetup sites. He recorded some of the encounters and the graphic videos were played during the two week trial. All right now, each week we cover cases involving people currently sitting on death row who've been wrongfully convicted because of prosecutorial misconduct or of those who are in fact guilty of the crimes they've been convicted of but are victims of a system that disproportionately sends the poor, the intellectually disabled, the mentally ill, and of course black and brown people to death row. Tonight out of Tennessee, we share the story of David Ivey, who was sentenced to death after being convicted of the 2001 murder of his girlfriend, Keisha Thomas, a crime David maintains he didn't commit. Sadly, the only photo we have of David as an adult is his mugshot, because David, who suffers from a learning disability, has spent nearly two decades on death row, locked up well before smart uh, phones were, with cameras were a thing. During his trial, key evidence was withheld by prosecutors, including a letter that alleged Keisha Thomas was in fact killed by a local gang member after a hit had been put out on her for stealing from them. Like so many on death row throughout the entire process, Ivy was represented by shoddy defense counsel and the investigator assigned to his case conducted no interviews. Here to talk about um, Ivy's case is his attorney, Kelly Henry. Uh, welcome back to the show, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Of course. Tell us briefly about the circumstances of David's case that led to his arrest and conviction. Certainly. So David Ivey grew up in Orange Mound, um, Tennessee, in Memphis. Um, he is the, the son of Willie um, Ivey. And, you know, he he grew up impoverished. He grew up in an area that was filled with violence. He witnessed murders um, in his own community. Um, but he you know, tried to start a new life. He, he got into trouble as a young man, went to prison, got out, um, and reconnected with his girlfriend from high school, Keisha. They had been friends since um, elementary school. He and Keisha dated. They had um, you know, a volatile relationship. Um, 
you know, he maintains that he never raised a hand to her. She told friends that he did. Um, and one day in 2001, she was murdered in her apartment complex in Memphis, Tennessee. People immediately blamed David, even though the assailant was not seen. He, um, the assailant had a mask. And what we later learned was that there were two people involved in the murder, that there was an eyewitness on the scene who saw two people. That was not revealed to David or his counsel. He was arrested, um, thrown in jail into 201 Poplar, and appointed a public defender who, had, who was only a part-time public defender and had a crushing caseload. One of the things we know about Shelby County, Tennessee, is that they use the death penalty as a means to get people to accept guilty pleas. And they charge the death penalty far more than any other prosecutors in the state. And so this attorney had a caseload of like 75 cases. He didn't visit David. While David was in prison, he was at what is the notorious 201 Poplar um, criminal justice complex. And that I should use air quotes if you could see me. I, I am. Um, it was mm -hmm. known as the jail from hell. The gangster disciples ran 201 Poplar at the time. There was even a um, mm -hmm. lawsuit filed um, about this. David escaped from 201 Poplar because there was a hit put out on him by the gangster disciples. And when he um, was caught, no one wanted to hear his protestations of being innocent. They threw him in solitary confinement. They basically starved him to death. He lost over 50 pounds. He began hallucinating. Um, and was completely heavily medicated at the time wow. of trial. Wow. Now, the prosecution's case against David um, relied heavily on witness testimony, testimony that you've taken issue with. Why? So um, the testimony in this case, which, you know, you know, as an attorney, Yodi, hearsay should not be admissible. And that's one of our major issues in this mm -hmm. case, is that the prosecution put on hearsay testimony from the victim you know, through her friends. What we've learned through our investigation when we got on the case and were able to obtain the district attorney's file is that it appears that the gangster disciples intimidated these witnesses into their testimony and the DA knew it, yet they withheld this information. And I should say that this district attorney is the same district attorney who withheld exculpatory evidence in the Nora Jackson case, um, which is an infamous mm -hmm. case that was the subject of the book charged by New York Times um, columnist Emily Bazelon. Nora ultimately received you know, relief and is out of prison, but this is a pattern in practice in the Shelby County DA's office. This is the same DA who is involved in the Purvis Payne case, the same DA who opposed DNA in the Sidley Alley case, and here withheld evidence uh, in the way of a written letter that detailed how there was a hit put out on Keisha Thomas and how the witnesses were intimidated in this case um, to testify against David Ivey. And the letter itself was a letter amongst the gangster disciples within 201 Poplar in an attempt to get David Ivey killed before he went to trial. Uh, Kelly, we're running out of time, but I want to get um, one more question in quickly. Uh, you filed an appeal. What can we expect in David's case? We are waiting for the judge to decide whether or not to give us an evidentiary hearing. We have requested um, permission to issue subpoenas to the Department of Treasury and other institutions that have exculpatory evidence in David's case. The last thing I'd like to say, just watching your show tonight, Yodi, I feel like I learned so much about my own cases. When I saw the video of what happened in Aurora, I thought of David because when he was 11 years old, the cops pushed his face into the ground, into glass. The scar you see on his face is from the police officers grinding his face into glass on the concrete sidewalk in Orange Mound, Memphis, Tennessee. That's why David had to run. That's why David couldn't trust the criminal justice system, because that's what he learned law enforcement does to mm -hmm. black people. Kelly, we've, I've got to go, but I appreciate you, as always, for coming on and talking about your case. Thank you so much for your time. All right, that's it for Making the Case. Up next, Prime with the incomparable Charles Blow.